Hi. Welcome to our unit on information and biological systems. We're going to begin this unit with an overview of our historical understanding of how biological systems process information. And we'll see how that develops over time to our modern understanding. The main question that we're going to answer in this video is how do we know the structure and function of DNA? It turns out that DNA is really, really important, and there's a long historical progression of developments in biology that led us to understanding what DNA looks like. So the point of this video is just to learn about the major historical developments that helped us get to our current understanding of what DNA looks like and how it functions. So we're gonna go back in time and then work our way forward. And there's gonna be a parade of mostly deceased white male scientists. Let's dive in. The first major place that I wanna spotlight is our understanding of the nature of inheritance. And this work was actually done back in the late 1800s by Gregor Mendel, who did some experiments with pea plants. We're not gonna talk a whole lot about them right here, but we should just understand that he determined that inheritance patterns could be investigated scientifically. He came up with a whole method for doing this. And that once they were investigated and understood, that understanding could be used to predict the kinds of ratios that we'll see in offspring. The next development that I want to spotlight is our understanding of chromosomes. Chromosomes were uh, independently discovered by these two gentlemen at the end of the 19th century. And it was determined that the behavior of chromosomes during cell division was exactly like we would expect if they were the inheritance carrying molecules in cells. So after this determination, investigations of inheritance really focused in on the behavior of chromosomes and the makeup of chromosomes. Just to put us all on the same page, we should understand that in eukaryotic cells, the chromosomes remain in the nucleus until cell division. And it's during cell division that the chromosomes emerge as the structures that we recognize, like in this slide, with the X. Because the focus was on chromosomes, people started trying to pick apart the chromosomes and see what they were made out of chemically. And it was determined that chromosomes are actually made out of two different biological molecules. They're a mixture of DNA and protein. DNA doesn't exist by itself in the cell. It actually exists connected to a variety of different proteins, an example of which is shown in this graphic. We see a nucleosome, which is one of the major structural units of DNA in a cell. And that nucleosome is itself made out of protein, in this case they're called histone proteins, and the DNA, which is wrapped around the histones. Now, of course, we know this now, nobody knew this then, but they were able to determine that chromosomes were complexes of DNA and protein, which then set the direction for inheritance research in terms of looking at the role of protein and DNA in inheritance. We're going to jump ahead a little bit to an experiment carried out by Frederick Griffith in the beginning of the 20th century. Griffith was a disease researcher, and he was looking at a type of pneumonia caused by a bacterium, Streptococcus pneumoniae. There are actually two different forms of Streptococcus is pneumonia. There's the S strain and the R strain. The S strain is pathogenic. It is the strain that causes pneumonia. The R strain does not cause pneumonia. They got these names because of the difference in appearance between the colonies that these two strains give rise to. The S strain forms smooth colonies and the R strain does not. Griffith's experiments involved live S strain, live R strain, and heat killed S strain bacteria that he was injecting into mice to see what would happen. So we're gonna look at four different instances of Griffith's experiment and see the result in each case. In the first instance, Griffith injected mice with live R strain bacteria. Now the R strain is not pathogenic and unsurprisingly, the mice survive, which is exactly what we would expect. When Griffith injected mice with live S strain bacteria, unfortunately the mice died. But again, that's exactly what Griffith expected based upon his understanding of the nature of R strain and S strain bacteria. When Griffith injected mice with heat killed S strain bacteria, the mice survived. This makes perfect sense because that, those bacteria were dead when Griffith injected them, so they couldn't cause the disease that killed the mice. But then Griffith did something else that was pretty interesting. He injected live R strain bacteria and dead heat killed S strain bacteria. Now, if you look at the results of our previous experiments, you would expect that in this case, the mice would survive because live R strain bacteria doesn't kill mice and dead S strain bacteria doesn't kill mice. But surprisingly, these mice died. And to make it even stranger, when Griffith went in and necropsied these mice, he was able to isolate living S strain bacteria, which was not something that he had injected into the mice to begin with. Griffith's main conclusion was that there was some sort of transformation that occurred when he injected the mice with the live R strain and the dead S strain that caused the R strain to become S strain bacteria. This helped to establish the notion of a particulate nature of inheritance, that there was some sort of molecule or particle 
being transferred that allowed for heritability. And in this case, allowed the live R strain to become live S strain bacteria. Later in the 20th century, Griffith's work was refined by Avery, McCarty, and McLeod. What they did was isolate purified S strain protein and purified S strain DNA and use those to carry out transformation experiments. And what they found was that they could transform R strain bacteria into S strain bacteria using a purified solution of S strain DNA. But when they tried to carry out the transformation using a purified solution of S strain protein, it did not work, suggesting that it was DNA and not protein that was in fact the transforming agent and the molecule of inheritance. The final experimental result that really established that DNA was the genetic material was carried out by Hershey and Chase. In their experiment, Hershey and Chase used bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria. Bacteriophages have two main components. There's a DNA molecule, which is surrounded by a protein coat. Here's how the Hershey and Chase experiment worked. Hershey and Chase grew two different populations of bacteriophages in radioactively labeled elements. They used radioactively labeled phosphorus and radioactively labeled sulfur. The purpose of this was to radioactively tag the DNA and the protein. DNA has phosphorus, but it does not contain any sulfur, and protein is the opposite. It contains sulfur, but it doesn't contain any phosphorus. So by growing phages in these two different media, they were able to label the two different molecules, which enabled them to track their behavior during the phage life cycle. After they'd grown enough of these phages, they allowed the phages to do what they do. Phages are viruses, and all viruses infect cells. In the case of bacteriophages, they infect bacterial cells. So Hershey and Chase allowed the bacteriophages to infect two different bacterial cultures, and then they interrupted the infection process. Once they interrupted the infection process, they then looked and saw which bacteria were now radioactive. When they did this, they saw the bacteria that had been infected by phages that were grown in radioactive phosphorus had transferred their radioactivity into the bacteria, whereas the bacteria that were infected by phages that had been grown in radioactive sulfur did not show the same transfer of radioactivity. The conclusion here is pretty inescapable. DNA is the heritable material, not protein. So from this point onward, we're just gonna look at experiments that helped to determine the structure of DNA. And we're gonna start with the composition of DNA, work that was done by Erwin Chargaff during the 20th century. Chargaff looked at DNA in a bunch of different organisms, and we have a table here of the organisms that he looked at, and he noticed a couple of pretty interesting things. The first thing that he noticed was that there were different percentages of the four nitrogenous bases that make up DNA in different organisms. But he also noticed that in all cases, the percentage of A was always equal to the percentage of T, and the percentage of G was always equal to the percentage of C. And you can clearly see that in his data, which I've outlined in green. Other work that helped to determine the structure of DNA was carried out by Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin, who were doing X-ray crystallography work on DNA crystals. And Rosalind Franklin determined that the structure of DNA would produce this X pattern during crystallography, which is a characteristic of a helical or spiral structure. All this information was then synthesized by James Watson and Francis Crick to determine what we now understand to be the structure of DNA, the double helix as it's called. So DNA is a double helix. What does that actually mean? What it means is that there are two strands of nucleotides that make up the DNA molecule. There are four different types of nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, or shorthand A, T, C, and G. And the nucleotides of any one strand are connected to each other by covalent bonds, what we call phosphodiester bonds. There could be hundreds of millions of nucleotides in one DNA molecule. Between strands, nucleotides are connected by hydrogen bonds, and they're connected according to very specific rules, what we call the base pairing rules. Thymine is always connected to adenine across strands. It makes two hydrogen bonds when it does this. And guanine is always connected to cytosine by three hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are nowhere near as strong as the covalent bonds that hold nucleotides together on one strand. But in the aggregate, when you look at hundreds of millions of these nucleotides bonded to hundreds of millions of the nucleotides on the other strand, the sum total of all those hydrogen bond interactions is enough to keep the two strands of the molecule connected and in its helical orientation. DNA has two major functions. The first is its heritability, which it accomplishes through the process of replication or being copied from one generation to the next. That's a function of the base pairing rules. So the strands of a molecule of DNA can be separated and then their sequences of nucleotide can direct the synthesis of the sequence of the opposite strand. The other major role that DNA plays in the cell is gene expression. DNA sequences hold the instructions that cells use in order to construct proteins. And proteins are the major way that cells influence their characteristics or their traits. These two roles of DNA are generally thought of as the central dogma of biological information flow. 
DNA is copied into RNA and RNA is then used to drive the production of proteins. DNA also copies itself. The process by which DNA copies itself is referred to as DNA replication. And the process by which DNA information is turned into proteins is known as protein synthesis or gene expression. This is our modern understanding of how the biological information system works. And in the rest of this unit, we're going to examine the rest of these processes at a more in-depth level. Thanks so much for watching this video. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain how all of the work discussed by all of the scientists in this video contributed to our understanding of DNA's structure and function. You should be able to see a very clear line going from Mendel through to the work of Watson and Crick and understand how each contribution that was spotlighted in this video contributed to our understanding. Also make sure that you can describe how the structure of DNA enables its functions. And finally, if you're given the sequence of a DNA strand, you should be able to determine the sequence of the opposite strand using the base pairing rules. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have or things that you're still not sure about and do what you need to do in order to get the answers to those questions. Thanks again for watching. Have a great day.